intergenerational joy. I don't talk I about talk that about with my that. therapist ever. I don't want to talk about intergenerational charm anymore. <laughs> I've talked about it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Beauty Of, presented by Ulta Beauty. I am your host, David Lopez. We're going to have some really beautiful conversations about redefining what beauty is and where it lives. I'm really excited to introduce two guests that we have on today's episode. We're going to be talking about appreciation, culture appreciation versus appropriation. And uh, I could not imagine two more people that were suited to have this conversation with for me and my personal life. Uh, I want to introduce to you Deepika Muthiala. You got it. I got it. <laughs> uh, founder of Live Tinted, which originally started as a community, yep. which I was, I saw the birth of it. I've known you, you for did. a very long time. And then that has turned into a brand that is carried at Ulta Beauty. Yeah. Um, I'm so excited for you to be here. I, I, it's just so beautiful to see your growth. Oh. Um, and then we also have Sarah Pademski, an award-winning Anishinaabe, Ashkenazi, multidisciplinary nice. artist, <laughs> um, and recreating the indigenous narrative, which I've been reading about your work, and I'm really excited to talk to you about this as well. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, if we're having this conversation about appreciation and culture. I'm, I'm Puerto Rican. I'm queer. Uh, but I did want to kind of set the groundwork that, you know, we don't speak for every person that looks like us or comes from where we come from. Yeah. These are our lived experiences living in America. Obviously, these are different experiences living in different countries. And I think it's important for anyone listening that um, might be sensitive to this, rightfully so, that we welcome all sorts of dialogue about how people might be comfortable or uncomfortable about seeing their cultures represented in uh, mainstream media, a.k.a. white media. Um, so, uh, but as it pertains to beauty, I did want to just have a really beautiful conversation about, again, how we redefine beauty. Mm-hmm. Um, I did have a question that I wanted to kick it off uh, with to deep because since I, you know, we have a history. I am so curious about the decision to kind of create this community before there was even a brand. I really felt like when I first met you back in 2015, it really was born from this, like, I could feel it when I met you. It was like, no, this is like living inside of you. You were like, I need to build this community because there are people like me out there that just want to see someone that looks like them. And this was like your YouTube video that blew up. If you haven't watched it, where have you been the last (laughs) seven years? Um, But what was that experience like for you having that kind of pop off and seeing people also that look like you? Was there a moment that you almost felt like, seeing the audience response and seeing who was responding to it, you almost felt like, oh, the representation that I needed is in my audience as well. Yeah. I mean, you nailed it. First off, I'm so excited to be here and I'm so (laughs) proud of your growth. Thank you. I don't feel like you say it to yourself enough, so I'm going to say it. David (laughs) Lopez is killing it and this is really exciting. Um, But yeah, you totally nailed it. I... This brand was something I wanted since I was 16 years old growing up in Texas. I dyed my hair blonde. I got the blue contacts. I wanted to look like the beauty standards of everything I saw in the world, Um, whether it was like walking into um, a store and seeing the blonde hair, blue eyes, or turning on the TV and seeing the same thing, opening up a magazine and seeing the same thing. So it wasn't something I fell into because of the viral video, and I think sometimes because that happens very often these days – It seems that way, but this was a sort of purpose in me that I felt at such a young age, I felt like it was my mission to change this narrative for other girls who look like me. Mm -hmm. So then when I went off to work at the corporate side of the beauty industry and then have this video go viral on YouTube, which was so crazy, never could have predicted that. Starting the brand was always the plan, but the path was completely different. Um, The viral video, I became a beauty influencer, which, you know, like, again, growing up, That wasn't a thing when we grew up, like a beauty influencer. What did that even mean? Um, But I saw it as an opportunity the same way I did with starting this brand one day to create a platform and a hopefully a um, visual identity for other people who look like me within the media that Mm. I didn't have when I opened up the magazine, turned on the TV. And, you know, then I was able to be that token brown girl that was in a commercial that aired during the Oscars and um, uh, in a magazine that New York Times, like all these crazy things, right? But the coolest part was my DMs Mm. and emails from other South Asian women who said, thank you. 
it was like that simple. It was thank you. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a crazy feeling to get that from somebody that's a complete stranger that says, because of you, I feel seen, represented, and I feel like I can go for my dreams. Yeah. That was really surreal for me. And honestly, being a beauty influencer um, was never the dream, obviously, because it wasn't a career that existed. But beyond that, it was more so I, I always was a businesswoman. I, I wanted to start this brand. Being somebody who woke up and took selfies and did these fancy <laughs> sets and shoots was just like really yeah. weird for me. I mean, yeah. I have friends who like, they're like, I was born for this. And I, I don't necessarily feel like I, wa I was. Me. Yeah, you 100%, <laughs> 1 billion I was born percent. for this. Not no. enough cameras in this room. It's true. Yeah. It's, no, but like really, I think everyone watching this knows that about you. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, like I'm very comfortable in front of cameras, but like I love the business yeah, aspect of, of this. Like we've had the conversations about yeah. the business stuff. It like gets me s such a rush. Mm. Um. But I got so into doing it because of what this did for other South Asian women. Yeah. And then it reached a point where I realized it was time for me to start this brand. But the community aspect was simply because two things. Like I wanted those brown girls who were in my DMs to get an opportunity to go be the face. Like I had already been the token brown girl in every beauty brand campaign yeah. you could think of. And I found myself starting to suggest them for – um, campaigns. Like I remember like a brand would ask me and I was like, oh, you should actually work with XYZ person. Actually, Ulta asked me once and I suggested <laughs> an amazing woman named Hamil Patel and now yeah. she works with them. And so oh. I just think like it's it's a really full circle moment that made me realize, wow, like there are still so many people. So many that us. don't see themselves represented. Mm -hmm. And so starting as a community platform for me was honestly, every investor told me not to. They were like, you already have a platform, call the brand Deep Beauty and get it going. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. the name Deep Beauty, obviously I love the like double meaning I'm of like, it for deeper Phew. skins. Yeah. I know, I know. Yeah. Well, we also have trademark issues there, but, uh, <laughs> but beyond that, it was also um, Live Tinted to me is a mantra about living authentically in your skin tone mm. and we're all tinted. Yeah. And I love the unification it does for people from different communities to come and share their stories. So that's exactly what we did. Every day somebody would share um, a photo and tell their story from their perspective right. and their narrative. Right. And then that eventually grew into the beauty brand. That's so special. I, I It was so cool to see it happen in real time and have something be born from such an instinctual beautiful primal place of just wanting to be seen. Sarah, I wonder from you, you know, being an indigenous person, there's a very specific way that even as I was raised, how we portray indigenous people, specifically for me in the Americas. Mm -hmm. When do you feel like, did you, were you always aware that we were, you were portrayed, your community was portrayed a certain way? Or did you one day wake up to it? Like, oh wait, why are we being portrayed this way? And this is not my lived experience. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have two older sisters that were actors in the industry um, when I was around nine or 10. And then I got into the industry myself when I was 11. Um, and my first job was like full buckskin, like 1800s, like really? as a child actor. So that was just, that was the stuff that we were given. Um, right. And then there was... There was a time of, you know, transitioning where we thought that, like, this was going to be a moment, you know, in the 90s. And it kind of kept, you know, coming once in a while. Um, but it wasn't really until, like, the last probably 10 years that I, I saw the effect that it has on our communities. Mm -hmm. This idea of not seeing uh, us in a modern context. Um, it's like erasure. So people just don't think of us as being, you know, alive today because what we see in the media is, like what happened in the 1600s right. and contact and, you know, right. um, so I think it just became more, it became more apparent mm -hmm. that the more we can be behind our stories, like writing, directing, producing, um, and using our voices, like in a modern context, yeah. it just humanizes us. Yeah. And I think that that was something that I didn't really realize until, everyone was kind of having that conversation about representation, which has really amped up this last yeah. few years. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and everyone's yeah. like, I'm on it, we're doing it, yeah. you know? Um, well, but, I, my, my question is, will it sustain and last? I mean, I yeah. think so because now, like, as we can see here, we have proven that um, we, we can sustain this in our communities. And yeah. I think that, that unfortunately, you know, you know, money drives everything and people oh, want to know, yeah. like, you know, people want to know that like people are going to watch the show and they're going to make money. And yeah. so I think slowly as we prove that 
we are profitable, mm -hmm. just the way everyone else has proven to be profitable. Yeah. Profitable. Um, unfortunately, that was a big piece of the pie that was missing for a long time. And now that we're showing that that's possible, yeah. we're invited into rooms and spaces that we weren't invited before. So yeah, it's a shame that that's what we needed to do to prove ourselves. But I think the whole package is coming together. And I think we're just too, now we're just too loud. We're just too passionate. It's too far. It, we, yeah. we can't go back now. Yeah. And I think to your point, I think that it's been very smart how a lot of us have taken any sort of access we were given yeah. mm -hmm. and any moment we were allowed a little bit of privilege. And I'm like, no, I'm going to bring other people with me. Totally. You with Lim Tinted and you have the Shine Network. Yeah. Can you tell me more about the work that the Shine Network does? Yeah, so that's my sister, my sister's brainchild, Jennifer. And um, it's, a, it's about representation. It's about... Um, it's about education and sharing resources for yeah. indigenous, uh, you know, filmmakers, um, uh, for female indigenous filmmakers. And it's, it is exactly what you're talking about. What you mentioned before, we in our communities always want to share and always want everyone to profit. The health of the community is the most important thing. Mm. We're nothing without the health of the community, mm. you know, individually. So the shine network is, you know, a way of inviting, you know, underrepresented people into a space and giving them kind of like the the tricks of the trade and resources resources and mentorship to say like awesome. this is just what we've been we've just been left out of this for so long and when we have an opportunity to share that's when we are you know we're at our best mm -hmm. and it's you know it's kind of those secrets that like it is a very eurocentric you know white world that we live in and it's it's finding those little ways of saying okay well how can we how can we also, you know, um, what are the barriers to access and how can we also help each other yeah. kind of climb those ladders and learn how to work within that system? Because for the indigenous system, for the for the indigenous community, I find just from my personal experience that we do things totally differently right. when we're right. when we're creating and right. when we share knowledge. And there's just totally different, you know, there's different um there's different protocols. Yeah, a yeah. different structure. How yeah. do, I, I, sometimes I'm here, I'm sitting in this room, I'm thinking about someone listening that is just, you know, someone from a place they've never even met a brown person or, or had an intimate conversation with someone who's indigenous or South Asian or queer. How does it, or how do we distinctify between appreciation and appropriation? And this question, question was posed to me, and I have to say, I, I feel very strongly about it, because until I have the equity that the people with privilege have, I feel like it's still appropriation. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's just for my own personal kind of belief system. But I also, as a Puerto Rican person who the entire world has adopted our Jennifer Lopez and Ricky Martin and our Bad Bunny, like Rosalia, who is not Caribbean, literally sounds like and sings music like she's in the Caribbean. There's a part of me that, as you were saying in our communities, we're, we share everything. We're like, come, who, come into our yeah. church, come into our house, play the tambourine, sing our music, talk like us. Like, we love it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But I think the flip side to that to me is that when that's then adopted and utilized in ways that leaves me out of the conversation, yeah. me personally, or I feel like it leaves my culture out of the conversation, if that makes sense. It's like so, exploitative. It's exploitative. Yeah. So I, I I sometimes wonder, there are things that I had to kind of dismantle in my own mm. kind of universe about specifically, you know, indigenous culture, for example, when we say things like when you're a kid, they say sit in Indian style, things like that, that I'm like, oh, those are so deeply ingrained yeah. in our society and in, in our like, kind of vernacular. Let's have a powwow. Have a powwow. And I'm like, that. or what's my spirit yeah. animal? And yeah. I'm just like, wow, these are things that we people yeah. don't even think about. Yeah. So how do we meet these moments with grace? Yeah. Because I always say this, people don't know what they don't know. Totally. And like there was there, there's, there was the, this huge, you know, savage was like a huge, mm. huge word the last few years. And I was always so triggered by it because that's the, that's like what we were called. We were called savages. I'm right. not going to lie to you until you just said that. Same. That did not hit. And I think for a, lot, for a lot of people, and it's not like I... I don't, I can only speak for myself, but like, it's not like I held any one person responsible for that. Right. Yeah. It's this idea that, oh my goodness, we're all like lacking knowledge in so many ways. Oh, yeah. And things have become, you know, th people have become so comfortable with, you know, their language and all, like deeply ingrained these issues. Um, and I always just, I just, I think of, like kindness, mm. I have the capacity at the moment. I know sometimes I don't have the capacity right, for right. kindness. We don't or always patience, have the bandwidth for it. Right? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. yeah. Um, so I think like if you have the patience for anybody to slowly one person at a time, 
you know, check in, um, you know, try and dismantle those ideas a hundred percent. If you can feel safe in the conversation and do it, I think we all have a responsibility to do that because we can't change the education system. We can't change society all in one. It's the one by one thing. And that I noticed that like when I tell someone one thing, they go and tell five people and Mm -hmm. then they realize that there's, there's something that that can be done. And that's like an actionable thing that everyone can do. And it's like, and, and you do it for other, for other people. I love it when it's non-Indigenous people that say that, you know, and same when someone shares something with me that I can share that I don't have the lived experience, but I can be like, I spoke to someone once and they gave me the context for that saying. And, you know, just so Mm, you know, the context, you know, which is always missing. I think when we, when people are angry about something or they want to explain something to someone, Again, this is me saying this is just even a queer person. Yeah. When I get all, a barrage of comments of people who just don't understand me, even though it they are coming at me with anger or like any sort of like misalignment of values, I always put myself in a position of where does this, what about me is triggering them? Mm. Because basically what they are exhibiting is the same symptom of what is basically holding me back and oppressing me. They are also oppressed in their thinking, in the way that they're viewing me. They're triggered by me. That's a symptom of the oppression. It just comes off different ways. And I think in the digital world and things like Live Tinted and the Shine Network really allow us these spaces for people, at least for me, I I grew up at a different time. I'm 30 blank years old, I will never say. Um, But (laughs) I I didn't have that access. I think about younger people behind us yeah. who look like us, the world, I will never know what the world is like for mm. someone who's 15 years old right now yeah. that can go on a phone and see people that look like them and talk like them and open their minds to maybe conversations are, that are not happening at their kitchen table. Yeah. When it comes to social media, and it's, it is giving a voice to underrepresented folks, to underrepresented people. Um, I also think we have seen with TikTok, it also can erase people from conversations. How do we navigate that kind of digital line, that digital world? And I'm curious from your perspective with Live Tinted, because you play in such a digital space, what does that look like for you as a community? You know, when you feel like, one example I can think of is the whole like the brown lip liner and the clean girl aesthetic, you know, we we all know where that went. But when it comes to a digital community, how do we navigate that line, you know, in a digital space? So I, it, it's questions we ask ourselves before every launch because I, I think, first of all, it starts with the brand actually having the right intent and the conversations mm. internally, which you would be shocked how much it actually doesn't as someone who used to work on the other side of it. Um, we just so deeply care. Like we're working on our concealers right now and um, the darkest <gasps> shade. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little tea dropped. Um, it's, yeah, it's going to be leaving at lunch and you will get it all time. Um, but Amazing. it is just the intentionality, right? Like the, we were working on the shades and the amount of time we took mm. on the shades, calling the deepest shade number one and then going mm. from there to the lightest shade and, and just the little things yeah. that we're not going to scream but just do, um, I think, are the, the small things we can do. Then the other part of it is for me – I've always wanted Live Tinted to be this massive beauty brand that just existed amongst all the other beauty brands, not in a separate aisle meant for brown girls, but like with everything else that just for the first time ever centered brown women. Um, So you see us amongst Caucasian, every tint under the sun, but for the first time you center us. And I think when it comes to then, when you have influencer programs or trips or events you do, that same mentality needs to stand. Um, We need to make sure that we are compensating and doing things the right way with these kinds of creators also so we can empower them. Like it was really beautiful. Someone on my team the other day said, um, we're doing something for Black History Month and they were saying like, what if instead of giving them flowers or, you know, a fancy dinner, what if we ask them what tools they need to do their content creation? And like, it was such a great idea from my team and shout out to them. Resources, equity. It's equity. Mm -hmm. It's it's the tools and the resources, right? And it goes back to like what you were when you were saying what, what you're doing, it reminded me and kind of like took me back to a time where I felt like I had to compete with other brown mm-hmm. girls rather than come together and share those resources. Yeah. And so it was part of the reason I was like, I want to show that we can coexist. There can be two South Asian brands that win. And especially with recently, um, eye beauty has become a thing with Ayurvedic beauty, yeah. um, which is so amazing, right? 
Um, but I want to make sure that the idea of like, th there shouldn't just be one of those brands. Yeah. And, you know, we were talking about our friends earlier today. There's so many out there and I just want us to support and show that like, we actually are stronger together, not in the cheesy way, but like from a yeah. factual mm -hmm. way. Um, and we have to support and give each other resources. Yeah. I think it's tough because for so long we we got such a little piece of exactly. the pie. Mm -hmm. So it's not- The system set us up. It's right. kind of like the scarcity thing that yes. everyone yeah. says, the scarcity complex yes. mentality totally. of just like, well, I'm the only one in the room, yeah. but I yeah. think we're all kind of utilizing like the space yeah. to give the resources to other people yeah. because there is enough room for us. But I also think that's, I mean, I hate to be so provocative, but I think that's that mentality is like my colonized brain. You 100%. know what I mean? It's like- Oh yeah, it's totally. Like, oh, yeah. You know, and it's, it's like, like the crabs in the bucket mentality. Yeah. You're like, let's not be mad at each other. Let's be mad at the person who put us in this bucket. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be real, because it's totally true. Like yeah. we and and even like decolonizing our minds mm. is has been so important for me because I realized, like you're saying, I've been in competition competition with other native actresses. I've had that resentment and that jealousy, and I've had to work through this idea that like yeah, it's about sharing and we are stronger together. But like that's uncomfortable, and nobody totally. really wants to admit that to themselves yeah. or speak about it, you know, out loud. But it's it's so true. It's like there is enough for everyone. There always was in our communities, traditionally how we how we existed, and it's this colonization that has put us back yeah. into this competitive, you know like just d like desperation yeah fully yeah. desperate we come from a desperate place like yeah i yeah. M my mom told me this once and and i i it's one of the the kind of moments i hold on to the most desperation holds hands with degradation mm. how do you feel about people purchasing your work that are not a part of the indigenous community yeah. displaying your work out Good there in the question. world. Like, how do you feel about that? Is it purposeful? Tell me, can you tell me more about that? I love it. I love it. I think there's some incredible native artists that are reclaiming traditional practices that were literally illegal for us to practice. Mm. Um, like what? Uh, beating. They were illegal? Uh, yeah. Like it was, mm. I mean, I'm from Canada, but you know, it kind of varies. Um, but um, yeah, there, it was illegal for us to, to practice our, our, our traditions. So this idea that there are artists reclaiming these practices and making a living off of it is yeah. a huge, a huge part of reparations, like just in general, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is a, a small part of educating about how we need to support indigenous artists in their indigenous work. Uh, because there's a lot of appropriation of our work, there's a lot of non-indigenous people that mm. make dream catchers I was gonna and say that. I was gonna and, say that. you know yeah, and, I, and I started making them just because I was like I was tired of seeing white people make them oh my gosh I'm having flashbacks so, <laughs> of elementary school making them yeah so and like I mean it's all we it's what we know so, yeah, like, yeah you know so I think that it, there's a something really beautiful in reclaiming this narrative of you know our creative um, traditions and also like being part of the economy. I think that's the big thing is that mm. when people buy from me and they, I get emails all the time, they're like, can I purchase this? Can I put it up? Can I buy this for someone? Like a hundred percent for me personally, there may be other people that don't feel the same way, but as long as you're supporting an indigenous artist and it's indigenous made a hundred percent. And, and the thing too, which is tough is that the time and the knowledge and the traditions that have been tra passed mm. down, um, I'll take like beaded earrings for example, they are expensive because the time that it takes to do them properly, um, you can't, you know, you can get something on Etsy made by somebody else that's not as thoughtful half the price. Yeah. But it is the idea of, you know, respecting um, how respect our piece. community is pricing and making and and you're, you're also helping support um, – you know, people reclaiming their culture, mm. which is like, it's huge. It's That's not, so it's not just something simple, like a purchase. Um, it means, it means a lot. It's really mm -hmm. important. It brings up the kind of idea where you said reparations about like what that looks like. And I think yeah. sometimes I have like a white friend or a cis friend who's like, what can I do to help? Mm -hmm. And so much of it, I'm like, it's actually really simple. It's like, if you are going to buy indigenous yeah. art or you're going to buy something like that, yep. why don't you seek out small businesses, yeah. small yep. creators? Yeah. The same when we work with brands, what you were doing, you're like, you're asking for me, but I, I have plentiful work. Look for other yeah. brown and black mm -hmm. creators, other queer creators, mm -hmm. you know? And I think about even things like with your brand, Deepika, it's it's interesting to me that even 
the buy-in from a white cis person or a white person is it i think it holds something to I, me i i don't know if you feel that way so but i was at um i was at sundance last weekend and it was the first time i was stopped on the street by a caucasian woman who pulled out a hue stick <gasps> and was like i love your products oh my God, so cool. i literally teared up and she was like i'm sorry i don't want to bother you i was like are you kidding me <laughs> like that was the coolest feeling yeah. ever because it happens all the time with um south asian women and of course that makes my heart so happy Happy. But to me, the bigger uh, we can amplify and have people pull out this product that was founded by a South Asian woman, that to me is showing young girls that they can do it too, right? Mm. And just when you think about the sheer numbers, like there are millions and millions of South Asians in the U.S., but there are way, way, way more <laughs> white people. Yeah, and so yeah. honestly, the reality is that like it is important to get their support yeah. and it is important that they put their money to support mm. brands like mine to show the investors of the world, the acquirers of the world that we can do mm. this too. Yeah. We deserve to be here too. And I think the problem is even when I went for um, fundraising, because they had already invested in a black female brand, mm. they didn't want to invest in mine because they put women of color into one bucket and see it as, oh, well, this is kind of filling the quota for our portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the more we show that all of us can coexist the same way Bobby Brown and Laura Mercier can, yeah. the more we can show, again, that more people should be doing this too and create more equity for our community. Yeah, and I want to make the distinction too that it's not like we are chasing the white gaze. Or yeah. The, G-A-Z-E, not gays, like gays, hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's, I want to oh make gay. the very clear distinction that it is, it, the reason it means something is because we do need the allyship in That's every it. possible way. Yes. Yep. You know what I mean? It's yep. like, do I need them to like my brand? No, it's not what I'm creating it for, but I do need the support from the majority culture, yeah. yes. if that makes sense, because that That's gives right. me some equity, that gives me a leg up, that helps me yeah. in general in a society that is set up against us. Yeah. Um, and also the like specifically for my brand, like hyperpigmentation is at the root mm. of it, which which is who Affects doesn't everyone every human, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? You could be it doesn't matter your race or your sex, like whatever it is. And so to me, it's like I I almost wanted to. I can't help but scream from the rooftops about my culture and my identity and do things to celebrate it through my brand because I never saw those things happen for a brand growing up. The Volley Holy, all those things we do with yeah. Lipton did. Mm -hmm. And it's just a brand that they love that exists in the world that just is there, yeah. ha that happens to be founded by It doesn't a have South to be Asian designated woman. as this is yes. a South Asian owned, women owned brand. Yes. It's just like that's a brand in the same way we look at other brands. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know? Yes. What role, and this question's for both of you, what role has your culture played in your own personal relationship to beauty? Mm. Ooh. I, I mean, I think in a positive and in a, in a <laughs> A positive and a negative mm. um, that yeah. I never really felt like I, because I, you know, I also come, my father is Jewish and, you know, my mom is Anishinaabe. I never really felt like a hundred percent comfortable as either because mm -hmm. I was mixed. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it, it took a long time for me to appreciate um, that intersection. Right. And to not compete and try and be white, I think especially as an actor, yeah. you know, you, I wanted to just be hired and I wanted to look like the people did on TV and like act like them, like, you know, really to mirror an ingenue and like don't move your face too much and don't do this and don't be like animated Jewish and yeah. like all, you know, all this, yeah. this community that wow. I grew up with. And then like, yeah. you know, and people didn't have a reference for what native women look like because, you know, there was, we all was cast like very stoic, long, mm. you know, straight hair. So I think it was very confusing for a very long time. And only now my understanding just how diverse our community community is on its own mm -hmm. within the native community. There's so many mixed people. Um, and I really think that it just, it's got, taken a long time for me to be, be comfortable in my skin, yeah. especially in the film and television industry. Um, but I always saw, you know, I always saw my mom who is brown and like just, she was always the most beautiful thing to me. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is hard in your brain when you're like fighting for yourself to try and fit into a mainstream beauty, but then mm -hmm. you see 
you know, my sisters and my mom, which I always just like looked up to and how beautiful they effortlessly beautiful I felt they we were. We love moms. Yeah, you know? we do love moms so, here. Yeah, yeah, so it's like it is it's funny. It's I'm still balancing it too, mm-hmm. you know. I, totally. I'm still in the media and you're still constantly like, you know, my weight, my looks, my wrinkles, I just turned 40. Like it's a constant battle. Yeah. But I know that internally and authentically, um, the like authentic beauty and like inner beauty is something that's like far superior to whatever is happening here. Yeah. And that when, you know, I feel joyous, I feel beautiful. So it's mm. kind of chasing more of that like happiness and joy now rather than like a physical manifestation yeah. of what You're that is. You're also physically stunning. Yeah, oh. yeah literally. <laughs> just FYI. <laughs> literally. I, I <laughs> if think... anyone's listening instead of watching. <laughs> yeah, just go to YouTube <laughs> and Thank watch you. it. It's, I, mean. I, I love that, you know, our, our cultures are, I, if I know a lot of brown, black cultures are so celebratory of like what we look like. Yeah. And I don't mean that in a way of like what we physically look like. I mean like how we adorn ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of intersections, I yeah. think, between me being Puerto Rican, yeah. which is an amalgamation of, you know, um, people that were brought to the Caribbean from, you know, Africa. And then we have, we were colonized by the Spanish and the French. And then we have the, the native people, Taino. And yeah. so we obviously have our, the way, our way. And then, you know, South Asians, the way you adorn yourselves and all of that. Mm-hmm. Where do you feel like the intersections are in that and like how that influences or doesn't influence how you present in your every every day life if that makes sense like i'm loud all like i'm literally <laughs> like i might as well be walking down a parade every day at this point you know what i mean yeah 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 but do you feel that you carry that with you even in quieter moments and i don't know yes. i don't know and forgive me i don't know too much about you know your community i know a little bit obviously about you know yeah, South I mean, Asian. you know, you have like bendies behind you, right? Zarna, like, Zarna Garg, who was here, here in spirit with us now, we she love her. showed me that she she wanted me to wear one. She said, "Please oh, celebrate, yeah. Yeah. love it." Um, it's it's heavy. People have mixed opinions yeah. about that. I also like at Indian weddings and stuff. I love when people are in saris, but it is there. I see also the like Coachella angle when people mm. are out there with the henna and the bindis. I understand, and also in the Native American, oh, like yeah. yeah, the indigenous. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Halloween is a big time for us. Oh god, <laughs> oh, god. I think specifically. Specifically, f- from my perspective and how I've seen it manifest in the community, the fetishization of Native women mm. is a real problem because we have thousands of missing and murdered Indigenous women, um, and it is a—it's not a sci-fi movie. It's like real in our communities. We're targeted at higher rates than anybody else, you know, in North America. So it's really like it actually the trickle Ugh, down the tr- trickle down effect for us is like a real thing in terms of. Um, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, the sexualization of Native women. So I think that, like, when someone dresses up as a Native woman for for Halloween, it's just, it's, it, it leads to much bigger problems, yeah, societal more, problems. Yeah. And then also, it kind of dehumanizes us so that when, you know, there is, there, you know, is violence against, you know, our communities, um, it's like easier to turn a blind eye because there's like no reference for who we are today. It's like we're caught in this, this like visual of being these mm-hmm. like quiet Pocahontas types. I was gonna say that was like yeah. that was the first person I ever yeah, learned about. Yeah. And then I remember being in school. I'm just yeah. a curious child. I had the movie, and then I was like, no, what actually happened, Pocahontas? Yeah. And I remember I went to the encyclopedia, and I read that she basically was taken and then taken yes. back to the UK. And I was yeah. just like, oh my god, no, this is wrong. And was like a child. Yeah. Was a child, Brian? Yeah, she was literally a child. Yeah. yeah. I'm also born on July 4th, and I yeah. feel like a lot of guilt right now. Sit so, like, no. I'm, I'm, like here you didn't America. do this. You didn't do this. You did not do this. You did not do this. I have a question. When you when you dress in your traditional you know, makeup or traditional outfits, how do you feel in those moments? At this age, it's just a completely different relationship now versus as a kid, right? I had a duality of a life that I'm sure a lot of us can relate to. I would go to Indian weddings or go to like our version of like church on Sunday and like um, I would do temple. Yeah. I can say what it is. You yeah. tell me. Yeah. I don't know why yeah. I'm still. Do you hear me? I, I said church. Our version of church. Oh temple. my God. Yeah. Literally, I went to temple on Sundays mm-hmm. and I would wear Indian clothes. I would wear saris. I would wear gagras, whatever. Um, and then I would wake up on Monday and pretend like none of that wow. happened. How did you feel then wearing it? When I was with my other Indian friends, I felt like I could breathe. I felt mm. like I could be who I really was. And um, my mom would sometimes pick me up from school wearing saris, and I would be mortified. I would have friends come over to my house, and they'd smell the chicken curry, and they asked to leave because they couldn't handle the smell. 
I know, which is like LOL now because everyone's favorite <laughs> thing ever is like, you know, dosas and chicken tikka and yeah. stuff. But I feel like um, now it is my absolute favorite thing and I try to show it loud and proud as much as I can and do campaigns featuring you it. Do. And it is so important to me because I didn't feel that yeah. way growing up. And then I think there's the subtle ways too, like you were saying earlier. Yes, there's the days I get like fully in the ga- the outfits and everything. Um, but then there's the days where I just wear like the jimkas on my ears and and, or a bangle on my hand, and it's something my grandma gave me. And um, we did this p- collab with Barbie, and they um, made a Barbie doll version of me. And 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 I was wearing a power suit, but I had the little Indian jewelry on, yeah. right? Because oh, that to me, yeah. that's the Indian American who I am. You yeah. know, like that is that to me is I think what I want young girls to see because I saw the Barbie wearing the sari growing up, but mm. I never saw me. Like who I really, that duality of a human within one person, right? So I think the more we can celebrate it in big ways and small, in whatever feels right to you, um, it goes a long way just for your soul. Yeah. Do you think that people who are outside of our cultures can ever fully understand what it means to belong to our communities? Well, I'm. I guess I can speak to how I would feel about your community and yours, and I would say no. Yeah. Like, no, I mean, and, and I, I wouldn't, and I don't know if I necessarily would want to, like, I would mm-hmm. want you to have that experience and you to have that. And I would want to learn about it and understand it. And, but that, that I kind of feel like that's what makes it special to the mm-hmm. individual. It's like a beautiful thing. Yeah. There's, I don't know. There's something that's happening in our community, which, which is people pretending or uh, race shifting. It's, they're calling themselves indigenous with questionable background and right. stuff and some are like there's a huge conversation it's very political right now um and it's gotten into a place where like there's like a lot of policing in our community which isn't great um but i find that there's something so interesting but you're talking about this kind of this community wanting to be part of community i think it's very effortless for us growing up in communities that have you know a real sense of uh, togetherness mm-hmm. and yeah. culture yeah. and tradition that I think I took for granted as a Jew and as a, sure. as a native person is that like, you know, you go to powwow, you see this beautiful culture and you can understand why people who are not part of it are just so enamored yeah. and intrigued and want to be part and of it. romanticize it. Because they've been colonized for so long. Mm. They've been colonized longer than we were colonized, mm. you know? Wow. So this, this kind of memory of like uh, community and it, you can tell that it's just when I hear these stories of people who are being called out, the way they speak about how they felt um, accepted by the community mm. is really what they were chasing. Mm. And so I know that like it's not it's not this like evil thing. Yeah. It's that like we have this beauty that we're able to live with every day that we know that we're part of. It's like this comfort knowing that and we can. And people are searching for their version yes. of a community. People want to feel like they fair. belong. That's and fair. I, and yeah. it's, it goes back to something that I, I, I keep thinking about. No one is immune from the systems that have oppressed all of us. Yeah. Even the people who were not as oppressed as, yes. you know, everyone else. Yeah. And I think that's where people are starting to become attached to and wanting to find community because we realize now in a world that feels very scary and it feels very lonely, where is your community? Where is that? What do you, wow, where are people yeah. who look like you, who think like you, who talk like you? Where are they? I grew up in Europe. I had my immediate family and that was it. And even in my family, where every shade, every hair texture, you know, so I grew up from an island. We, we look, you go to Puerto Rico and we all look like everything, you mm-hmm. know? So I already kind of had that erasure of like what I look like. And then adding the queer piece to it, I didn't come out as gender fluid until two years ago. I would have never been caught dead wearing a heel and this much makeup. Through, but when I met you, I would have never. I mean, no. having pink hair when I met you was already a lot for me. You know, yeah. I would have never thought but about it. But you had very different energy. I did. You did. It's yeah. really cool to see you come into what I think is the most confident version of yourself. It's the more, the most real. I, I felt like I was wearing the... The costume. I, I really was I David Lopez hair could, costume. Well, you could sell to the world yeah. as like, hi, hire me. Yeah, which is fair. We have to do what we have to do. 100%. You know? Oh, my God. I went but through we the exact same thing. Exactly. Like, I again, like the Indian culture and leaning into all of that. I did not feel comfortable doing that until I got to a certain level of privilege. Mm, I mean, that is just yeah. facts. Um, and I wish that wasn't true, but it is. I've gotten to a certain level of success that makes me that much more comfortable to be able to showcase that part That's, of myself. It's a, such an important piece of the puzzle, yeah. which is so unfortunate, but it is. It's like that that 
exter- that um, the exterior feeling of um, success mm-hmm. almost like gives you that little boost to lean into your authenticity. Yeah. Do we think the next generation is going to have to go through that? I hope not. What is one thing from your culture as it pertains to self-care or beauty mm. that you still do today? Mm. Um, God, so many, but I think, (laughs) I think the biggest thing is, I mean, eyeliner and kajal is such a big part of Indian culture. Um, and like the first product that my mom said she ever used on me was taking a a kajal and putting it behind my ear as like an evil eye. And for people who are listening who don't know, what is kajal? Kajal is, is is like essentially a form of eyeliner and the most like simplest terms of doing it, um, or saying it. Um, I always get so nervous saying something and not saying it the exact way that Indian people would define it. So I'm just going to call myself out right now (laughs) before somebody else does. Yeah. Um, But yeah, like, and so we've come out with a product that's like that and we're coming out with another one. Anyways, the point is that I feel very deeply connected to eyeliner because it always reminds me of Kajal and going back to my, not just pictures of my mom, but my grandma and her mom, there's always this thick black Kajal under their eye. And so one of the products that was so important for us to create is that eyeliner. Um, and I don't know when this is airing, but it'll be live at some point in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> oh my God. Um, so anyways, I, I guess my point is that like, I like to take those elements, like a red lip. I mean, that's what started my whole journey. Mm-hmm. I was, was of putting red lipstick under my eyes to mask dark circles. And my mom growing up would take a red lipstick and put it on her eyes, cheeks, and lips. And that's one of the first products we created. Okay, and so, go off. Oh, gee. My mom wow. was low-key an influencer. <laughs> she said lip, cheek, and eye product all in one. All in one. Okay. She didn't know it wasn't safe. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's okay. We have clean products, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, but oh yeah, God. I mean, I think so much. It's It goes back to what we just said. Everything I disliked about myself growing up, my big eyes, my mm. thick brows, um, I hated them. They are my favorite things about myself now. Because yeah. yeah. they make me identify with my not just South Asian, but South Indian. And roots. Yeah, it's beautiful. What about you? My instinct is is to say um, like smudging when we pray, when we mm. use uh, sweet grass or sage, um, because as I'm as I like as I'm getting older and I'm kind of trying to get back to like my authentic self and my decolonized brain, um, feeling a connection is really beautiful for me. And I feel like slowly getting back to those traditions. Um, and even when, you know, I, I go to ceremonies or powwows and, you know, there's, you know, someone's doing a prayer and they're smudge and you see like everyone's taking the smudge and they're, you know, they're cleansing themselves. It's almost like the, I don't know, it feels like the beauty wash of just like, mm. you know, we're cleansing, we're, 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 it's, an even, it's a very deep cleanse. Yeah, like a, yeah, like yeah. a spiritual. It gets yeah. right down in there. Yeah, but it's like this beautiful. this idea of f- feeling um, new and that like in the moment we're connected to our ancestors, we're connected to ourselves. It's like this whole kind of spiritual thing that I find I'm reaching for more um, in my beauty practice. Mm-hmm. How can I balance myself and how can I remember that I'm connected to everything and that there's like, you know, there's a responsibility to that. Mm-hmm. So it's funny, that was instinctually what I said. I don't really know anything else like that I physically do other than that, that would make, that I, I must like now that's in like the, the beauty routine, not no, in yeah, like I, a, it's, it's beautiful. Well, it goes back yeah. to you saying beautiful from within. Yeah. yeah. And I don't want to like, I, that's just for me. I don't want to minimize, you know, prayer or smudging or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But I find that I, when I'm connected in that way, it feels like, it feels like my authentic beauty or light yeah. is I'm able to connect with that much easier. I think there's this like this concept for anyone who's not familiar, it's like, you know, generational trauma, you know, that they say mm-hmm. that that kind of trauma lives in your genes and it lives in your DNA, lives in your blood. But I also think in the same way, a lot of the beautiful experiences of our cultures also live in our blood. And I think that's a really great way that you're honoring that. And I think that's like very special. Intergenerational joy. People survived so much shit for yeah. us to be here. Yeah. Like it's insane. The- and despite it all that our cultures are still able to find joy and to yes. celebrate and yeah. to be loud and to adorn ourselves mm-hmm. and to honor and I think it's people like us and our generation and generations coming yeah. uh, after us that they continue that. In a- the fact yeah. that we're sitting at this table right now having these conversations I know. is wild. Yeah. <laughs> wild. Yeah, it's really yeah. beautiful. It is. Um, 
I'm so happy that both of you joined me um, and talked about this this conversation. And, and to, again, to anyone listening, I, I'm so curious, like, you know, what are your thoughts about your mm, culture and where yeah. you see it appropriated or appreciated and how you feel? Because it is such a deeply personal experience for people. Yeah. And I think it's important that we also understand that, you know, I can't speak for everyone. You can't speak for everyone. Yeah. But this is how I experience the world through my, my own lens. But I always keep an open mind and open heart. Yeah. And if someone tells me that something hurts them, I believe them. Yeah. Every time. It's not up to me to decide whether or yeah. not it does. Um, I love you. I love you. Thanks I love for you the invitation. Both. Oh my God. So We're not done. We're going to play a little game. Oh my oh, gosh. Okay. They said it's surrounded by beautiful things that people have left here or shared with me. Um, and I like being surrounded by experiences that I will personally probably never have. And it reminds me to kind of keep my perspective as open as possible. These are just physical manifestations of the conversations I've had. But uh, I understand I have something in this box from someone. I think it's yours. Yeah? Okay. I don't know. I'm okay, I'm going to give you the box and you can give it to me. Sure. Okay. I think it's, it's mine. Ah, it is. Oh, oh my god! Oh my gosh, that's incredible. It's a little baby one. <gasps> oh my god, that's so beautiful. And it's turquoise. I have a, I have to have a moment of vulnerability. I have a dream catcher <sighs> that in my apartment, and my boyfriend literally is like, please take that down. <laughs> and I'm like, but it's so beautiful. And I, I even after having our conversation even more today, I was like, I need to take it down. <gasps> I this is beautiful. <laughs> and if you're listening, please go to YouTube and look at this. You made this. Yeah. This is gorgeous. Yeah, and thanks. you make them in different sizes and you make them in I different I make them in different sizes. Yeah. I mean, my schedule is a little bit kooky. Yeah. So I I just make them when I can make them, but Can you tell me more about just a make just a cliff yeah. notes version of dream catchers and yes. a little bit of history of them? Yeah. So the web is based on a spider's web and it's it's nice and sticky in there and uh, it's made with vegan sinew, so no animals were harmed with that sinew. What is sinew? Um it would be made out of um sk uh, like skin uh, Oh traditionally. Yeah, traditionally. Right. Okay. Yeah, very thin, um, and then it dries really strong. Right, I'm vegetarian, so thank you. And um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so the 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 teaching that I was given was that um, the good dreams get stuck in the in the uh, web, mm -hmm. and the bad dreams get stuck in the stone. So oh, when the, the sun rises, there. so when I the did sun not know that. so when the sun rises, just like you know how you charge stones. Um, the uh, the stone releases that negativity, but all the good dreams and the good energy are still in the web. And then traditionally wow. there was feathers, so they were right. put on baby cradles to keep them visually stimulated. Um, they were like put on so that they could yeah, like a mobile. Could, yeah, like a mobile, yeah. like the original mobile. And, yeah, um, exactly, yeah. <laughs> like the original mobile. And um, yeah, so traditionally they had feathers that like the good stuff would drip down to the feathers to the dreamer's head. So I just, I replaced that with, with wool and just gave it like a bit of a modern twist. Oh but, my God, yeah. this is beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. That's so sweet. Oh my God, that's so sweet. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, <coughs> I, uh, <laughs> I didn't really know what I was doing. And now that I've seen the set, I'm going to make sure your producers and like whoever is handling all of this gets... What you're once you see this, you're gonna be like, I cannot believe this is what you like. You made it about my, I made it about myself. No, um, I would hope so. But now that I get it, I am getting you a crown because what Stop. I'm showing you, I'm going to get you a crown because what I'm showing you is a picture of me from when I was in the eighth grade. And the reason I wanted to share this photo, it is so embarrassing. And again, I didn't oh, know what I was doing. Oh, my God. And I'm not going to have you frame this photo of me oh, and put it up here. I'm getting you a crown. It's going to be framed. No, no, absolutely not. This is so, I, like, embarrassing. I now get what we're doing. You're wearing the contacts. That's I'm, and, amazing. And the, my makeup doesn't match my skin tone. And it goes back to something so deep-rooted that I know, like, it's not just my culture who experiences colorism. And so when I saw this photo and the questions I was asked to, like, bring something about – this moment brings me back because I was Mardi Gras queen and I lived in Louisiana at the time and the only ethnicities in my school were black and white and me and I didn't know where I belonged. Like people would ask me if I'm Russian or Italian, like crazy. Yeah, it was just, so I didn't know what to be. And so going back to like the products not matching my skin. Um, but then the other layer to it is I, and I'm, I, I'm going to speak for myself. I wanted so deeply to be cool at that age. Mm. And so becoming Mardi Gras queen in the eighth grade at this school where nobody looked like me, I just felt like I made it in yeah. America. Yeah. It was this like really That's a like, cool moment. it was like what my mom and dad were there. I did a slow, if you scroll down, my dad and I did a slow dance together. 
Is that do you see is that what that is? Yeah. Um, and like I just it was a moment and it made me feel like, oh my gosh. And then going from that to then I judged Miss Universe a few years ago, it was just like a really cool moment. So anyways, I'm going to get you a tiara and you're going to have it here. And that's going to be the memory you have. Oh, I cannot wait. I'm sure little David (laughs) Oh my God, of course. I wanted to be have a crown. Yeah, you want to. You're gonna get a crown. Yeah. We're getting. We're getting the crown. I remember being like little. I'm like I was like I wanted to be prom queen, not prom king. Yeah. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, like I was yeah. like I want to feel like the way I see the cis women in my life feel. Mm. I felt like men were never allowed to feel so ceremonious and still be feminine and soft but powerful. I felt like it had to be like gruff and devoid of all color and like it couldn't be beautiful and loud. And I was just like. Yeah, that's one of the things I love about our culture is, but like, yeah, this is really special. The crown is going to fit oh perfectly God, in here. It. We're okay, definitely going to do perfect. a video of me wearing it. Thank you. I I do feel like I need maybe a little small uh, nope. something of nope. that. No, 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 no. I would be mortified. There is zero photos of any guests here. Oh my God. We're not, okay, we're not that would make me so happy. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you both again for sharing space and your light with us. And for anyone listening, uh, please, you know, pop in the comments or send us DMs. Do you want to let everyone know where they can find you and your work? Yeah, uh, you can follow me personally at Deepika on Instagram, on all the things. Um, More importantly, Live Tinted, (laughs) L-I-V-E-T-I-N-T-E-D, whatever shade you are, every tint that you are, please support. We are available at Ulta Beauty. I know this is hard, but do you have a favorite Live Tinted product? I'm sure you get asked this all the time, and it um, might change often. It's but. the concealer that's launching this fall, but because I'm just so excited. Okay. Yeah, it's beautiful. Everything. Um, yeah, I'm only on Instagram. No, I know that's that's hard <laughs> that's enough. enough. That's enough for me. That's hard enough. <laughs> uh, at Sarah Podemsky. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much. It's so good to meet you. You too. This was so fun. This was really fun. And you know what? It's just so important because it's just an invitation for people mm-hmm. to continue these conversations. The conversation. I learned so much. Yeah, yeah so did I. So, so did I. And I hope yeah. I hope Thank everyone you. that was listening or watching, I hope you learned something too that opened your mind and opened your heart um, that you can carry out into the real world. And until next time, so much love from me to you. Hope you're happy, well, and safe wherever you are. I'll see you all very soon. Bye-bye.